Thank you very much. Thank you for those kind words. Um, right. I am going to share my screen. Oh, hopefully everybody can see the presentation. Right. Uh, thanks for coming. This is the selfish meme. Uh, just before I start, what have I learned today? Well, firstly, Alonso introduced Salvador and mentions uh, the, the grey hair joke. I noticed he didn't make a joke about my hair. Not, not quite sure why that would be. What I took from Salvador's talk was it's important to be deliberate about your management techniques, your, your leadership techniques, which is something that I find interesting because I found I've had success, but I've very, I find it very difficult to articulate why. Um, I need to translate this slide because uh, it looks useful, but I can't, I can't speak Spanish. Um, then what did I learn from Sonia? Well, I think I learned that um, Santander has a really cool design department, uh, as well as learning, uh, again, about uh, being deliberate about how understanding we, we can be and, and moving on from uh, uh, how well we're, we're dealing with people and we're, we're developing people. Uh, that, that slide's really cool. I really like that. I wish my artist was that good. I also learned that Zoom has the side-by-side -side view. I could have just taken screenshots of the whole slide and then I found that out later on in the talk. And of course, always uh, uh, one always learns that Google Translate is always your friend, of course. So uh, I'm gonna talk about memes. Um, well, I, I hope the word means the same in Spanish. Um, and nobody told me it didn't. So hopefully we've got away with that one. Uh, as, as was just said, I've worked in software for a long time. We don't need to know that now. Um, and I'm not a geneticist or a biologist. That's quite important to understand. What I'm going to talk about is uh, built on some of those theories, but really it's a conjecture and it's a management, a sort of uh, culture technique that I have found useful uh, in the last couple of years. Um, you may have heard of this book, no idea what the Spanish version is. It was written in 1974, I think, and it was very controversial at the time. Uh, and I'll come back to that. Uh, this is where the word meme was actually invented, 1974. Uh, and also this book, which is less well known, David Deutsch is a, a quantum physicist. Uh, he's very big in quantum computers. Uh, he wrote a very famous book called The Fabric of Reality. Uh, this is a less famous book that he wrote, uh, which I found absolutely fascinating. I love it. It's one of the best books I ever read. So I've taken ideas from these two books and applied them to what I see around me as a consultant in um, uh, company culture, organizational culture. So what are we talking about? Well, you may have heard of The Five Monkeys. I don't have time to go into it, but there's a link to it. You can have a look at it. I prefer to talk about things I see around me in the real world. This is uh, this was a couple of years ago, just down the road from where I live. I was walking to town with my daughter and I saw this sign. Uh, that's my Google Translate version in Spanish. Uh, it says caution broken glass. You can see that someone's gone to a lot of trouble here. Um, oh, you can't see the glass. It's there. Oh, you still can't see the glass. There it is. There's the broken glass. Why do I show this? Because what this tells me is that at some point, Back in prehistory, somebody hurt themselves on some broken glass. In response to that incident, somebody came up with a process to avoid anybody ever hurting themselves on broken glass again. And I, I have no doubt that stage one says secure the area, make sure no one can stand on it. What you've got there is four pieces of, of orange plastic fencing. They are tied together with tie wraps. And if you can't see it in this picture, but the one at the top of the stairs is actually chained to the stairs and padlocked. Someone's gone to a lot of expense to stop someone standing on this glass. But if we were just focused on outcomes instead of the process, somebody just would have picked that glass up, would have, would have swept it away in two minutes. Instead, this situation persisted for about three weeks, which I find absolutely astonishing. That is what we call in English risk management theater. It's when a process grows up, outlives its usefulness, but still persists because nobody knows how to get rid of that process. Nobody knows who owns the process often. So that's culture. Uh, risk management theatre can be part of big cultures in big companies. So here's some history. Uh, Richard Dawkins introduced something that he called the replicator in the book, The Selfish Meme. These are the precursors to modern genes. Uh, viruses, which are quite big in the news at the moment, they're replicators. All they are is, is organic compounds that somehow find a way to replicate themselves. If they're good at it, there are various ways they can be good at it. They can be very stable. So if they're unstable compound, they decay, um, they're not going to replicate. If they're very stable, they can persist, they can go on longer. 
they could be very good at replicating themselves. So the better they are at replicating themselves, the more likely they are to persist. Um, and if they're, the fidelity is important, the, the fewer mistakes something makes when it replicates itself, the more versions of it there will be in the future. Now we see this with, with genes, with viruses. Uh, uh, viruses mutate. We've heard a lot about virus mutations recently. That's to do with fidelity. How often, you know, whatever the replication mechanism is, how, how, how true are they to the previous version? Now, uh, Richard Dawkins conjectured in his book, The Selfish Meme, uh, that uh, plants and animals, which includes humans, are nothing more than survival machines of the things they contain, the replicators that they contain, which is genes. So Dawkins, that was why it was very controversial, because he was his conjecture was based around the fact that it is genes that are driving evolution, driving things forward. It's not the people that live on into the next generation, it's the genes. There are still genes in existence now that were in existence tens of thousands of years ago. Those are the things that replicate into the next generation. Those are the things that go forward, not the survival machines, the people, the animals, the plants that carry them. Now, one thing, this is the basis of my conjecture is something called competing alleles in genes. There are many different genes and, and it's oversimplistic to say that genes directly influence behavior, but they, they take part in it. There are many populations of animals that exhibit hawkish or dovish behavior. That is those that are ready to fight and those that won't, will never fight. Now those are interesting strategies of evolution. Uh, a dove uh, will never get injured in a fight. And a dove may well win a confrontation against another dove because one of them gets bored and walks away. So they can get some evolutionary benefit from that. On the other hand, if a hawk attacks a dove, the dove will always run away. So it will always lose a confrontation against a hawk. Two hawks is a different matter. One will win the fight, but at some cost. And the other one will lose both the fight and will lose some fitness to survive thereafter. So those strategies can coexist in animal populations and they do exist, coexist in animal populations. What tends to happen is that an equilibrium is found. Sometimes one gene, one behavior completely dominates and the other behavior is eliminated. Sometimes an equilibrium is, ways, uh, is reached. And the, the equilibrium, uh, whether it's one or the other, can depend on initial conditions. It can depend on the value conferred by the behavior. It can depend on the uh, volume of one gene versus the other gene in the population. So um, th there are some equilibriums that fluctuate up and down as one becomes dominant, then uh, its population can crash and so on. So what I'm talking about is how to alter the uh, balance of equilibrium at times. So. I did write a simulation in the longer version of this talk. I demonstrate it, but if you're interested, it's there on my GitHub. You can have a look at it. Now, what are modern replicators? This is the meme. This is a very famous meme that I remember one of the earliest ones, which is Disaster Girl. Everybody would put pictures of Disaster Girl on, on top of recent disasters. And that did very well in, well, in the 1990s, the early 2000s. Uh, you may also have heard of this meme. This is Exhibit. Uh, I quite like this particular meme because you're supposed to make it recursive. So this is something I learned a few years ago. I've never seen the program this guy's on, but uh, you make a recursive gene, which obviously appeals to a software developer like me. These, these are what we understand as memes today. When somebody says meme, they usually mean a video or a joke or something that is passed from person to person somehow these days, normally through the through the internet, through email, or just through sharing on share sites, whatever. Uh, but Richard Dawkins' definition was slightly different. Uh, he referred to a meme as any kind of information that passes from person to person. So people are the vectors for memes, and the memes can confer value. Now, in terms of the, what we're looking at here, these modern memes, the value they return is, is purely entertainment, and that's why they propagate. The, the, the more entertaining the meme, the more likely it is to live longer, the more likely it goes through the population. But what I started noticing is that uh, according to the original definition by Dawkins and according to what uh, um, David Deutsch's conjecture, David Deutsch talked about culture in society being influenced by cultural memes which pass from person to person. And they sometimes they're valuable, sometimes they're not. Uh, he particularly pointed to the Athenian and Spartan culture and told us that uh, the Spartan militaristic culture had a lot of memes in it, which were useful for a very long time. 
but then ultimately they became less useful when the technology of Athens started to overtake and surpass the technology of uh, Sparta. So I've noticed that there are memes in organizations and those memes take the form of uh, behaviors. They take the form of, of, as I said earlier, what I would call risk management theater. So why do those memes exist? Well, they have to confer some sort of value to the individual. So when does a process become a meme? I think I've touched on this already. Um, processes can grow up. A good example would be testing, uh, two weeks of testing. Now, this meme grew up in a lot of companies back in the 90s, early 2000s. Here's some new software. We test it for two weeks. It doesn't work now, but there's a test team that's grown up around it. There is, there is a whole belief that testing is the right thing to do in this way. People want to do code reviews. That can be a meme. Why do you do it? Well, people can't often articulate why they do things. They say it's just the way we do things here. And I think uh, a process has become a meme when you hear phrases like, it's just what we do here. It's the way we do it. Well, I don't know why we do it, but we just do it that way. So why does that happen? What does it go on? And here's some examples of what I think are suboptimal or destructive memes, a bit like anti-patterns. You know, a lot of companies say, well, something went wrong. Somebody needs to be blamed. That's a meme that I think I could regard that as an organization level meme. Another one, uh, you hear this a lot in, in English speaking. I don't know about Spanish speaking. Nobody gets fired for choosing IBM. It, it, it obviously doesn't apply now, but we still say this. It's like going for the obvious choice. That encourages people not to think outside the box. And that really holds a prevalent view in a lot of organizations. Um, and there's some other. Uh, we have a two-week test cycle I've mentioned. Code freeze is, is like a technology anti-pattern, anti-agile meme. It's really hard to get over those. Branching to isolate changes, I mean, this is a bit more engineering focused, but you know, I, I think these are all memes that one can attack and exploit. And, and when you start thinking about them as memes that confer values to individuals, you can start to change them. Here's some good memes. Uh, if your organization believes in outcome over process, I think that's a good meme. That should be passed from person to person. Uh, I love saying to people, sh you shouldn't talk about an experiment that succeeds or fails. You either get result A or result B. The only time your experiment fails is if you get an inconclusive result. And there's some tech-focused memes as well that I think are good memes. Now, here's the thing. I think you can come into the viewpoint and start saying, right, how do I exploit the fact that these memes are in competition with one another? How do I do that? Well. Um, firstly, you have to understand what the competing memes are. So in technology, uh, we do pairing, we don't do code review because code review is about sharing um, the, the context of something. So um, that, that would be one thing. So recognizing those, what those competing memes are is the first step. Then having done that, we have to think about the equilibrium. So as a consultant, I might go into a company and say, we, we shouldn't be doing code review. We should be sharing context through pairing it takes a long time to get that meme uh, to, to try and replace the existing meme with my meme, right? And um, one way to do that is I've got to shift the equilibrium. I've either got to get more people uh, on my side to support the code pairing meme, or I've got to change the value statement that the change the value that the meme confers to the vector of that meme, which is to the obviously the person that is passing it on to somebody else. Uh, okay. So altering the balance, yep, and there's some ways we can do that. We can we can put more people into our meme. We used to do this at ThoughtWorks. We do it a bit at uh, uh, Cogerance, where we put a lot of people in one team with maybe a couple of people from the client. Then the memes, the good memes can shift over to those people. Then you can split that team and join other people in. And, and slowly, by starting with a smaller population, you can effectively get your meme to be prevalent in that population and then expand into the wider population. That's a good way to do it. The second way, and this is really important, is to change the value of your meme to the vectors, that is to the people. Now, it's important to realize that if someone says to you, if I say to people, why do you do code review? You'll probably get told by those people that the reason why you're doing code review is because you, uh, you want to know the code works. Actually, I don't, for well, firstly, I don't think that's ever the reason why people do code reviews. Uh, I think it's to share context. But secondly, actually, a lot of people don't even know why they're doing it. They're doing it uh, probably for comfort. So you need to change the value of the meme with those people. 
You can also increase the fidelity through training of your good me to try and replace the old meme. I think I'm being given the hurry up. She's kindly written it in English in the chat for me this time. Or you can make it better to, to breed. You can make your meme take on um, uh, better at replicating itself. You can do this through learning processes, through book clubs, through lunch and learns, evening meetups, things like that. That's about building community. Um, finally, I don't know why this slide is here. I thought it was at the start, but I'm not a biologist or a geneticist. Yeah, this is a model of an organization. It's definitely a lossy model. It's a simplification. I found it useful. You can find it useful. I wrote an article on, uh, I think that and that's on InfoQ. Uh, by all means, read that. It's got a bit more detail. Uh, so here's here's your summary. It's useful to identify the memes, understand the value and the organization value that each meme confers. So you can find a competing pair. Uh, and then once you've got a critical mass, that's the only way you're going to get your meme to, to move forward. You can't do it by teaching one person at a time. And that's my model on the selfish meme. And there's some books I found useful for this talk. Thank you very much for listening. I hope the English wasn't too fast and I, I hope that was understandable to everybody. Thank you very much.